Crossroads. My name is James, one of the pastors here, and it's great to be together. Hey, if you're new to Crossroads, we are so stoked that you found us. If you're online, wherever the camera is, uh, we're, we're really glad that you're with us here today. If you're in person, then we have an uh, incredible time here, and we're going to party out there. It's going to be like Chuck E. Cheese, a big old party out in the lobby and outside this afternoon. Hey, uh, Crossroads is a multi-ethnic, multi-generational church committed to making disciples, of, to growing the next generation, our kids and grandkids. And what that means is we want everybody to be healthy here, to be the kind of people that are, that are healthy spiritually, emotionally, relationally, connected to God and connected to each other in meaningful ways. So that's really what is undergirding everything we do. And we're gonna begin our morning by singing and celebrating the goodness of God. So if you guys will stand up in house and we are going to just rip the ceiling off this place and celebrate oh, yeah. together. Here we go. Wow. How y'all doing this morning? Good to see your smiling faces. Just like James said, doesn't matter where you've been, doesn't matter what you've done, doesn't matter what you're thinking, you are in a place today that's safe place. Just like this song says that God the Father has drawn us because he loves us so much. Let's sing about this love of God. Here we go. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink from the water, come and thirst no more. Come all ye sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table, he will satisfy, taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. Come on, let's sing together, God so love, here we go. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us.
Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Yeah. Oh, yeah. See. Well, good morning to you. Welcome to Crossroads Church. Man, what an exciting day to be here. Uh, Compassion's in the lobby outside. We're doing our uh, old-fashioned picnic. How many of you going to hang out afterwards? Oh, yeah, lots of you. Good. Yeah, we're going to have the Kona truck. I mean, that's worth sticking around for. And maybe most importantly, my friend, Sam Messerly. Where'd Sam go? He was right there. Sam Messerly. Oh, there he is. He's walking down the aisle. Everybody turn. He's in his Darcy Kemper jersey, which is really awesome. Because Sam lost a bet to me. I'm an Avs fan. He's a Red Wings fan. I said, you take every 31 team in the NHL. I'll take the Avs for the Stanley Cup. Here's the bet. And uh, yes, and so there it is today. So you can get a picture with Sam on your way out if you'd like to. Uh, He'd be glad to uh, do that with you. Well, if you're new with us, I want to welcome you to Crossroads. Uh, My name is Matt Manning. I'm the senior pastor here uh, at Crossroads. And if you are new with us, man, I'm so grateful that you are here uh, today. If you have a question, any question kind of long, why we do what we do, or, you know, something pops up, don't hesitate to stop by the Welcome Center on the way out. You'll see a text line a couple of times today. You can text your question there, or uh, if you're online, you can just put it in the chat box, and uh, we'll do our best to make up an answer, and so that you can uh, can have what you have. Uh, Today, as we get into to uh, the scriptures together, we're going to be in Acts chapter 4, and so if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn there. We are in our seventh week of a series that we're doing in the uh, book of Acts. And as we've gathered together every week, really what our goal has been is to try to wrap our mind around the theme of Acts, which is this, is that Acts is all about God moving by his spirit in the church. That that's the the theme of Acts. Acts is all about God moving uh, by his spirit in the church. It's the story of the gospel spreading from this little Middle Eastern city in Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, and then ultimately to the ends of the earth. And if you were here last week, uh, you heard me say that we can have great confidence in this story. And the reason that we can have great confidence in this story is because we're here today. We're we're halfway around the world that we are the result of this amazing, spectacular movement of the gospel through the world. And as we move forward into uh, the future, we will only see the gospel continue into the uttermost parts or the, the deepest parts of the earth. And so today as we gather, we are in kind of the beginning of the story where the gospel is still spreading through Jerusalem. And uh, what's quite amazing about this is that the group of disciples, Jesus' disciples, are moving throughout the city, and they're sharing the gospel, and they're doing so to amazing effect. I mean, the speed of the spread of the gospel is quite amazing that is happening. That in this part of the story, we're only about two and a half months, just shy of three months removed from Jesus' crucifixion. And as we remove those three months, already 8,000 people in Jerusalem, we're told, 15% of the city has engaged in, has believed in, has put their faith in Jesus at this point. And this isn't just some kind of like, you know, shallow, do-nothing kind of faith. These people are being changed. The Holy Spirit is filling them. They're, they're making a difference. They're, they're different in their lives, and they're making a difference in the world, in the world. And yet at the very same time as all of that's happening and all that's going on, the religious leaders of the day who are largely in the temple around Jerusalem are growing increasingly frustrated with this movement. See, they thought that if they killed Jesus, that the movement would end. That if they put to death the leader, then Jesus' ragtag group of disciples would just cower and life would go back to the way that it was always had been. That it would just go back to the way which was normal, which made them very powerful and influential and, and wealthy men. That's, that's what they were looking for, is just to return to, to normal. What they did not account for... And what they did not think would happen in a million years is that when they killed the leader of this religious movement, that it would actually cause it to grow. But never before had a leader just walked out of the grave either. And so this story that we're looking at today, like I said, we find in Acts chapter 4. And so if you have your Bible, you can turn there. We're going to get into Acts chapter 5 as well today. But really what we're going to see today is really just this snapshot of this community of, of believers, of people whose hearts have been utterly revolutionized by the gospel of Jesus. 
It comes on the story that we've looked at the last couple of weeks where Peter and John are walking up to the temple, and as they're there, they heal this guy who had been lame since birth. He runs around, he's shouting, everybody's celebrating. It gives Peter the platform to be able to preach the message that more and more people are coming to faith. And as a summary statement, we're given at the end of chapter 4 of what this community of believers, what this burdening church in Jerusalem is starting to look like. This is the character, this is the picture that we're given, verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimonies to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each other as they had need. Like, this is such a fascinating and amazing story. And as we begin, the important thing to note is verse 32 here, that all the numbered of believers, remember that's 8,000 men plus women and children at this point, that all of them are walking in unity, that they are one soul and of one mind, which means that there's no backbiting going on. Like everybody's getting along at this point. Nobody's been put in time out yet. You know, like, like this is what's going on in the church, that they are marked by their unity, that as they walk in this world, they are known because of their unity. Like this is the value that is made up of them, that they are one heart, one soul, one mind in the world. Now, If we're honest with each other, that is not the experience that most of us have had in church, is it? Like when it comes to church, that's that's not our normative experience. In fact, it's very rarely any church's normative experience because churches are made up with people with flaws and mistakes and sins. And so every church has its issues because people make up the church. And if you're brand new to Crossroads and you're thinking, oh man, Crossroads is like the best church, give us two months, we'll mess it up, all right? So like that's just your fair warning. Like we are people of who are who have sin, who we have flaws, we have mistakes. But in this moment in time, the Jerusalem church is, is beautiful, it's pure. And Luke, the writer of Acts, is giving it to us as this, as this like snapshot, this beautiful portrait of how the church is to be, how a congregation should approach its members, how members of the family should treat one another. And the question as we look at chapter four, the end here is this, is what is driving this unity? And can we as a church actually emulate this? Like what drives the unity that we see here in Acts chapter 4? And can we, should we as a church emulate it today? See, the unfortunate reality or truth is that oftentimes the church, and I'm talking big C church here, has tried to soften the message of the gospel in order to gain a following, in order to grow bigger that we try to, try to step back and gloss over our theological distinctions. We try to sand down the rough edges of our faith so that our faith is more culturally appropriate, more culturally acceptable. Listen, that's not what we do here. We are not ashamed of the gospel, that we believe that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. And the problem is, is that when we start to water down the gospel, when we start to to shave down the rough edges to make it more culturally acceptable, what we are actually doing is starting to soften our witness. And we're only actually giving the appearance of unity. We're not actually walking in unity. We're We're only giving the appearances of unity. Now, when we look at the early church in Jerusalem, What Luke is doing for us is not just describing the church in like the snapshot of time, but what he's actually doing is prescribing this is what every church looked like for all of time. That this is is the default position for the church. That the unity of the church was actually grounded in the gospel. That is, is that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, that he died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins, rose three days later, validating that message, and whoever puts their faith, believes in him, will be saved. See, the belief of this message is what unified the church. It was this message that was the building blocks for the early church that produced one heart, one soul among all of the believers. It's the type of unity that I pray would make itself known here at Crossroads Church. 
And maybe what's most interesting about this unity is that ultimately this gospel that led to this unity resulted in a radical living. I mean, did you catch it as we were reading through the verses there that that the radical living, all of a sudden, that we see these people, these believers, and remember, big group of believers, 8,000 people or more, that all of a sudden, they're, they're giving up their possessions. They're voluntarily and willing, taking their possessions, selling those possessions, taking all the money that they made from it, giving it to the church so that whoever had need, that it would be met, that it would be met. It was a complete rejection of materialism, that they recognized the value that they had in the gospel. And because of that, their lives were radically changed, where they were freed from, freed from, from the worldly possessions and free to use their possessions for one another. And what's so fascinating about this story that as we read through it is that we look at it and we look at it with shock and we say, could, could the church be like this today? I mean, I mean could, this, could this even be possible? And when we read through the Old Testament, what we see this early church in Jerusalem doing was actually mentioned in the Torah. Now, if you're brand new to church world, the Torah is just the first five books of the Bible. And what it is, is God giving them to the prophet Moses. And he's basically saying in the first five books is, this is what it looks like to walk with me. This is what it looks like to be my people. And so Moses takes the five books to the Hebrew people and says, you're the people of God. This is what it looks like to live your life for God. And in the fifth book, the fifth book is called Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy, it's the book of the law. It's all the thou's and the thou shalt not. It's the, here's what you should pay attention to. Here's what you shouldn't. Here's where you should go. Here's where you shouldn't go. Like, that's what Deuteronomy is all about. And in chapters 14 and 15 of Deuteronomy, there's all of these laws concerning how the people of God, how the Hebrew people are to interact with the poor, what they're supposed to do for the poor, the way that they're to engage the poor. And here's what Moses writes in chapter 15, verse 7. He says, If among you one of your brothers should become poor, in any of your towns with your land that the Lord your God has given you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. That this kind of of radical generosity was already supposed to be present in the people of God. It was already supposed to be taking place in and through the temple that's there in Jerusalem and its leaders. That this was supposed to be the marker. This is what they were supposed to be known for in the world. That this is how they were supposed to represent God to all of the peoples of the world. That's the way it was supposed to work. Now, this is so important and so, so, so uh, good for us to get. That when we open the book of Acts and we start reading through Acts, what we quickly realize is that God is setting up a brand new temple. That God is setting a brand new temple. And this new temple, the Spirit of God is going to descend on this temple, but it's not the old temple in Jerusalem that was destroyed that we're just waiting to be rebuilt. That's that's not the temple that we're waiting on in Acts. That the temple of God, the new temple of God in Acts is you and me. The way that the Bible describes it is that the Holy Spirit, when we believe in Jesus, when we put our trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit descends upon us and our bodies become the dwelling ground for God himself. The way the Bible puts it is that the Holy Spirit dwells within us, which is no small thing. That as we step back into the Old Testament, we see that when the Holy Spirit descended on people, it was for a specific person, uh, purpose on a specific person, largely kings and prophets. That the Spirit would descend upon a king or it would descend upon a prophet and that person was marked as the anointed one and that that one was the messenger for God. That was the one that would speak into the world and say, this is what it looks like to be with God. We get into the New Testament. We see Jesus is baptized and as he's coming up out of his baptism, the Holy Spirit is descending like a dove onto him and then there's a voice in heaven that cries out that this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. This is the anointed one. Pay attention to him. We move further into the New Testament and we see that the Holy Spirit isn't just dwelling in a few people, but the Holy Spirit is dwelling in every single person who professes faith, that you are called as a believer with the Holy Spirit in you, that you are now the anointed one, that you are the people of God to bring this message of the gospel into the world, being the living, breathing temple of God. This is no small thing. 
And so you have all these new temples of God coming together in community here in Acts chapter 4. Together, they're fulfilling the purpose that God always intended for his people, and that's this. That the temple would be a place where heaven and earth meet so that the peoples of this world can encounter God's presence through his generosity and his healing. The way that Jesus said it is in Luke chapter 12, verses 12 and 13, he says, or I'm sorry, verse 32, he says this. He looks out at his disciples, his people, and he says, fear not, little flock. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That everything that you see, God has created. All of this is his. This is his kingdom. And his intention is to give it to you. It's all yours already. So here's the conclusion. Sell your possessions and give it to the needy. Give it to the needy. See, this is exactly what we see happening in the Jerusalem church here in Acts 4. And they're doing it not because they're trying to earn God's favor by keeping church rules. That's not what's going on here. What's going on is that they believe the words of Jesus. They saw the power at work in the church, and it radically changed their lives where they became generous. They actually started believing that God the Father cared for them, that God the Father provided from them, and in that it freed them from their anxieties, it freed them from their fears, it freed them from needing material possessions, and it freed them for people and for love. I mean, come on, this is so countercultural, isn't it, in our culture and in our society? That we live in a society that absolutely, relentlessly promotes and prioritizes individualism, don't we? That we live in a society that is all about radical individualism and provoking the differences in us, whether that be the interests that we have, the race that we're from, the politics that we belong to, to the economics where we're at in the economic ladder, to how much education that we have, that the world goes about trying to polarize us on these differences, but the gospel is different. That the message of Jesus and the power of the Spirit is that when we come together as the church, that the people come together in unity around our love for Jesus, regardless of what work we do, what economic status we have, what education we have, the color of our skin, what, demo, what party we are a part of politically. That we are united together around our love for Jesus and together through the unity of the church that we can make a difference for the world. I mean, hear me on this. The same spirit that's at work in Acts chapter four is at work in you right now. Don't let that pass too quickly. That is no small thing to consider. That we read about this here and it's not simply describing the early church, but Luke is looking at us and saying, church, emulate this. That this is your marker in the world to be unified in radical generosity that's ultimately going to bring healing to the world in which you live in. And Luke, looking at this, knows how unbelievable this is going to be for his readers, not just today, but even back then. And so he says, hey, you can talk to my bud. His name's Barnabas. Go find Barnabas. You can find him, and you can talk to him about this. And so he introduces us in verse 36 to a guy named Barnabas. He says, this is my bud. His name's Joseph. He goes, everybody calls him by Barnabas. It means son of encouragement. Like, that's the guy you want in your corner, right? Like, like this is the guy you want to walk around with, the guy that's just encouraging everybody all the time. And Luke says, you can go find him. He's a Levite. He's from Cyprus. And here's his story, verse 37. He sold a field that belonged to him, and he brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. They were introduced to Barnabas. And soon we'll find out more about Barnabas as we go through Acts. We'll we'll come to find out all about Barnabas. And soon we'll see that Barnabas becomes the advocate and mentor of a guy named Paul, who will go on to be the greatest missionary who ever lived and will shape so much of our understanding about the faith. Barnabas will step up and he'll be the shepherd of the Gentiles in Antioch. When the church needs someone to lead their benevolent ministry, their their ministry to the poor and to the needy, they tap uh, Barnabas and say, hey, will you do it for us? that Barnabas Barnabas becomes one of the most selfless, lovable, mature, reliable leaders in church history, in church history. And he says, this is a story. Luke says, you can go ask him yourself. 
He had a field, he sold it. He took all the money that was given to him, he turned it over to the church, and the church used it for the poor, and the people celebrated. And the people in this, in this moment, they're hollering, they're celebrating, they're singing the praises of God. Everything's being lifted up for the glory of God and the way that God is working through their church, and specifically through this man named Barnabas. And there's a couple, of, there's a couple there, they're named Ananias and Sapphira, and they're watching all of this go down, and they go, I want a, I want a piece of that. I want, what, I want what Barnabas has right now. Like, like, I want in on that. And so we pick up their story in chapter 5, and I just want to tell you, this is one of the most shocking stories, not just in Acts, which is full of crazy stories, but also in all of the Bible. Chapter, one, or chapter 5, starting in verse 1, But a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your hearts to lie to the Holy Spirit and, and to keep back a part of it for yourself? And while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it you have contrived this deed in your heart? You've not lied just to man, <laughs> but you've actually lied to God. And when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and he breathed his last breath and great fear came over all who heard of it. And the young men rose and they wrapped him up and they carried him out and they buried him there. Three hours later, his wife Sapphira walks in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me what you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. And Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And when the young men came in, they found her dead. And they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. I bet right? Like God's killing people, right? I mean, people are just falling over dead. Like, like God's just smoking them off the earth. There's a lot of fear there. There's a lot of fear going on. Now, like I said, this is one of the most shocking stories that we have in all of the Bible. And I think it's important for us as we start to jump into this story in light of what we've just read to make an important distinction here. The reason that Ananias and Sapphira are dead, the reason that they drop dead is not because God is just waiting to smoke people. It's not because he's just sitting up in heaven going, <laughs> I'm just waiting, just with one of you, right? Like, that's not what's going on here. And the reason that I can say that with confidence is because in a few chapters, in Acts chapter 8, we're introduced to this guy that's called Simon the Magician. Have you ever seen the show, the movie Greatest Showman? This is like Simon the Magician. He's doing like these supernatural circuses around Jerusalem. And somewhere, somehow, somebody comes to him and actually begins to share the gospel of Jesus with him. And as he hears the story of Jesus, all of a sudden he's curious and he starts to, to attend the church in Jerusalem. And as he's paying attention through this, he sees the power, he's way, he sees the way the spirit is moving. He sees the unity and the radical generosity that's coming out of this church. And so after the sermon, he comes up and he talks to Pete, who's the pastor. And he comes up to Pete and he says, hey, how do I get some of that? Like, what's it cost? You know, I want to buy the blessing of God. I want to buy the Holy Spirit. And Peter just hammers him. I mean, he just, he just goes and lays into this guy. And he says, you, you can't buy the blessings of God. Like, like you, can't, you can't buy the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, Simon the magician doesn't drop over dead. Instead, he repents, and his, his life begins to change as he walks forward in his, as he walks forward in his faith. See, we don't have a God who's just sitting in heaven with a lightning bolt ready to strike people. If you have a past and every single one of us has a past, you don't have to be fearful to darken the doors of a church. God's not going to strike you dead. So if that's not what's going on, what in the world is? Because this story's weird, right? What Luke is doing is he's addressing one of the major drifts that emerges so often in the church and that is hypocrisy. This temptation within us to look better than we are when it comes to our faith. 
that Ananias and Sapphira serve to us as a warning. It is a stunning warning to the whole church for all of time that fake Christians will all end up this way sooner or later. It's a warning to us as a church that Ananias and Sapphira here, they, they have not been changed by the gospel. They're not walking in the spirit here. That they're looking at Barnabas and what's going on with Barnabas, and they're going, how do, we, how do we get some of that? They're faking it in order to get a more visible seat among the leadership of the church. They stink of hypocrisy. And Ananias and Sapphira are displayed for us to see them in contact or in, um, in contrast to Barnabas. See, where Barnabas sold his land, he did not step back and think of all the things that he was going to miss out on because he no longer had the land. In fact, his dreams were more about the glory of God and what God would use, how God would use this money and these proceeds in order to bring about his glory to impact the poor that lived around him. When Ananias and Sapphira, when when they looked at all the cash that they got from their lands, they're looking at it and begin to think how much they could do with the money that they now had. Barnabas never wanted to appear more generous than he actually was, that he didn't need the praise of man, that that what you saw was what you got, that he was real, and his integrity becomes the stuff of legend in the early church. Ananias and Sapphira, they, they lived for the praise of man. They wanted people to believe that they were more generous than they actually were, and if telling a little white lie was all that it cost, so be it. I'll step right into that. Barnabas walked by the Spirit, and through the Spirit he saw that one of the great gifts of the Spirit was that he could live life. He could live life in such a way that God's care was upon him, and he could stop loving the things of this world and start loving the people of this world. Ananias was, as Peter puts it, treating the Holy Spirit with contempt, which just means that that Ananias was dishonoring God, that he was making a mockery of the cross. He wasn't walking in the Spirit. Now, there are plenty of people who have read these passages through the years and have misunderstood the reason why Ananias and Sapphira were killed. You read this, and the temptation is to go, they died because they held back money, but that's not it. That Peter clearly states in chapter 5 here, he looks at us, and, or he looks at Ananias, and he says, come on, man. I mean, wasn't the land already yours to own? And he says, when you, when you decided to sell the land and the money was in your possession, was it not at your discretion to spend it how you wanted? That what Peter is doing is that he's affirming the discretion and the very right that Ananias and Sapphira had when it came to the possessions that God given to them. That this isn't about them giving money, the lack of money that they gave or how much money that they gave. That that's not what's going on here. The judgment for Ananias and Sapphira, their problem is that they lied about the fact and they held some back. They lied in their giving in order to look good to others. They were acting like hypocrites as they searched for the praise of man. And Peter calls them out and goes, man, this is a grievous sin. This is a treasonous offense towards the Holy Spirit. You got a problem. See, this is the reason or or this is the point that Luke wants us to get from this. That faking faith is a serious offense to God. That faking faith, God takes very seriously. And the reason that God takes our hypocrisy so seriously is because not only is it bad for us to try to get the praise for men, but it actually demeans the gospel in the world. See, when it comes to the world, the people of the world aren't looking at the church as perfect. They know that we're not. They know that we're not. The problem for the church is, is that oftentimes when we mess up, we pretend that we don't. We act like we're perfect. We, we walk around as if, as if none of this is, is even meaningful, right? I mean, our whole faith is built on second chances. And when we try to proclaim ourselves as perfect, not needing a second, ch- uh, second chance, we are trampling on the cross of Jesus. We are making a mockery of it. And the problem in the Western church is we stink of hypocrisy, that we smell of hypocrisy, that we have lost our sense of the gravity in pretending that we are closer to God than we are, that we have lost the sense of gravity of our sin, that R.C. Sproul, one of the great modern-day theologians, he writes it like this, 
that when we understand the character of God, when we grasp something of his holiness, then we begin to understand the radical character of our sin and our hopelessness. Helpless sinners can survive only by grace. Our strength is, is futile in itself, that we are spiritually impotent without the assistance of a merciful God. We may dislike giving our attention to God's wrath and justice, as we see here in Acts chapter 5. But until we incline ourselves to these aspects of God's nature, we will never appreciate what has been wrought for us by grace. In other words, every sin is an act of cosmic treason. There is no such thing as little sin, that every sin is a futile attempt to rob God, to dethrone God of his glory and of his sovereign authority. And certainly, our temptation is to look at Acts chapter 5 and what happened to Ananias and Sapphira and to look at the story and to balk at the harshness of the judgments, saying a little light lie is not deserving of that kind of execution. It's not deserving of God's wrath in that way. But that attitude only reveals in us how much we lack our understanding when it comes to God's holiness and the dark nature of our sinfulness. See, sin every single time is an assault on God's character. This is what causes the Holy Spirit to grieve. I mean, come on. The fact that God did not meet all of humanity with a tidal wave of wrath when Adam and Eve first sinned is a sign, is a gesture of his amazing grace. It is not a sign that sin is not serious. See, the real marvel of Acts chapter 5, the true marvel of this story, is not that Ananias and Sapphira were killed, but that God has not executed that judgment on every single one of us. See, that's the marvel of the story, that God's son came to die, not so that we could proclaim that we were perfect, but because we're not. That Jesus' son came to die, not because we were strong, but because we were weak. That Jesus came into this world not to build a museum for saints, but to start a hospital for sinners. For those who knew he, he needed help. See, Jesus died so there might be this community of, of new temple people who knew God's favor, who knew God's salvation, and went about this world becoming messengers of that amazing grace by generously living, radical generosity in the entire world, bringing about healing. And one would think that out of this story in Acts chapter 5, everybody would be like, well, I ain't going to that church. Right? Like, like, do you hear the church where the people showed up and they gave during the tithes and they, God smoked them? Like, ain't nobody coming to that church. At least that's what we'd think. But here's what happens. Acts chapter 5, verse 14, when the hypocrisy is put down, when the purity of the Jerusalem church is seen in the entire world, and more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. When the church lives in its pure states, where the message of the gospel unifies us and ultimately allows us to live in radical ways, generosity included, we see the world begin to be healed. It's what we see in the beginning part of Acts, even through the trials, even through the trials of Ananias and Sapphira. We see the church, we see the Lord moving his church forward. And so here today, we want to make this real, we want to make this practical, and that we have the opportunity to emulate the early church, that through our generosity, we can make a difference. Last year, we started a brand new partnership with, a, with an organization called Compassion International. And Compassion, if you're not aware of it, goes into some of the poorest and most poverty-stricken places in all of the world in order to bring the hope of Jesus through both physical and spiritual needs. It's what they do. That last year as a church, we joined together and we decided to adopt a whole community in Mazatenango, Guatemala. If you're a little unsure of how to get there, just head to Texas, jump over the border, go through Mexico, get to Guatemala, head southeast. And in southeast Guatemala, that's where Mazatenango is. 
And for in Mazatenango, the average family makes $1.25, $1.25 a month, or a day, I'm sorry, $1.25 a day. That they are the literal definition of poor and poverty. And for $38 a month, we can literally pull children out of poverty and give them a chance in this world. And the really cool thing that's worth celebrating is that last year, is that last year, uh, Crossroads Church adopted and sponsored every single kid that Compassion had in that city, 125 kids uh, last year. Yeah, you can, you can applaud for that. And so this year... So this year we said, hey, we, we want to go bigger, like expand the circle. And so we brought in another 120 kids all living in this, in this region of southwest Guatemala, and uh, they're ready to sponsor today. Listen, Compassion is a partner of ours because they are, they are Christ-centered, church-based, and child-focused. That's what they are. They are Jesus to the core, and everything they do is meant so the child has the opportunity to hear about the gospel of Jesus and to receive that, as well as to meet the needs, the physical needs that they have, from education to food to clean water to health services to even helping with their parents. That once this pandemic stuff gets behind us, our intention as a church is to start running teams to Guatemala so that you have an opportunity to meet the child and the family that you're making a difference in. And so here's the challenge today is that we have 120 kids just like this kid Armando uh, out in the lobby today. And if you're interested, what I'd invite you to do is to stop by one of the tables. You can take a look. You can pull out the sheet in it. You'll find uh, all the information about your kid, information about where he lives. And if you're interested or wanting to, I should say, sponsor a child today, what we need you to do is we need you to fill out this tear-off form here and drop it off before you leave. So don't steal a packet and say you're going to do it later, all right? I mean, take a packet. We don't want anybody dying today. <laughs> Just kidding. So if that's, how, if that's what you want to do, uh, if you want a child today, you can simply stop by, pick one of these up, fill out it, and then that child is yours uh, to sponsor, all right? Online, uh, there's a, hopefully a moment popping up right now where you can just click the link, and you can do this online there as well. Now, I wouldn't ask you to do anything that I and my family wouldn't already do. And so last night as we were setting up, we were praying uh, over the day and the kids, and we selected uh, a young man named Neymar, who's about the age of my middle son, Cademan. And we did so, we brought him home, we gathered all the kids, and, and we read about who he is, where he lives, some of the challenges that he faced, and then we just spent time as a family just praying for this kid that we are now committing to sponsor as a family. And so through our time together now, uh, you know, we had one kid age out of the program, and uh, we have a child that's the age of my daughter, now a child the age of my middle son, and uh, next year if we do it again, we'll probably add another one uh, for my oldest son. And something that we love to do as a family, writing notes, hearing about their lives, and hopefully I'm praying one day that we'll go and be able to visit these kids to see how we're making a difference in their lives because of the gospel of Jesus. And so with that said, I want to end in a time of prayer together. Would you bow our heads? Father, Lord, we come to you, and um, Lord, your spirit is amazing. <laughs> the way that your spirit moves, the way that we see it moving in, uh, in this early part of Acts is unbelievable. And to know that your spirit is dwelling every single one of us, that, that you have called us to be the anointed ones, the ones who, who speak your message into the world. God, there is no higher calling than that, and so I thank you for it. God, thank you for giving us purpose in life in that way. And Lord, today, as we, as we think about what you've given to us, and Lord, we live in America, and that means for most of us that we live in the top 5%, God. We live in the top 5% of, of the world's wealth. And, uh, and Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would move in us today. Lord, that you would speak some, to some of us today to step out of maybe our comfort and, and to sponsor one of these children and to give one of your kids hope in this life. God, ultimately, with all of our possessions, with all of the stuff that we have, it's totally our discretion. You've made that clear. And so, Lord, I just pray that we would only move if you're calling us to truly move. Father, I also pray for maybe people who are sitting here today, who are maybe like Simon the Magician, sitting on the fence of curiosity, looking out and, and wondering if all of this isn't true. Lord, maybe they can even smell some of the stink of hypocrisy on us. God, I pray that that wouldn't discourage them, but they would see that we are imperfect people, 
trying to live for a perfect God, that we are flawed and sinful, and that we fall to our knees and we receive your grace. And Lord, I pray that as we live our lives like that to the best of our abilities, Lord, that maybe the curious in this room would see that, that you would speak to their hearts and Lord, that you would awaken their souls to what you have for them. God, it's this that I pray. In the name of, the powerful name of your son, Jesus, amen. If you wanna have a conversation of what it looks like to follow Jesus in your life, if you have questions about who Jesus is, you can text Jesus to our text line, 720-513-1933. That we come together today to celebrate communion. That this is the gospel for us. Jesus going to the cross for the forgiveness of sins by his body being broken. We are healed by his blood being poured. We are forgiven. And so before we partake together as a church, I'm just gonna invite you into a couple of quiet moments to contemplate the way that the spirit is moving in your life today. So as a church in unity of one mind and one soul, we eat the broken body knowing that this is our healing. And we drink from the cup receiving God's forgiveness. If you need prayer today and you're online, you can click the button and uh, in that, uh, we'll be able to pray for you. In-house, you can make your way over the banner. We'll have people there ready to pray for you. We consider it a privilege to do so. I'm gonna ask you to stand as we sing in celebration of our Lord and Savior Jesus and the power of the Spirit moving through us today. Christ 
always hope, there is always hope. And there is peace in this storm, in this storm. Don't forget, He is Lord, He is Lord of all. There is a King of glory. Shout of praise, there is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. So lift your eyes, stand in awe, stand in awe. There is one, only one, where my help comes from. Lift your eyes, lift your eyes, there is a King of glory. The God who saves, one who is strong and mighty, freedom is in his name. Open the gates of heaven, lift up a shout of praise. There is a lion roaring, Jesus the King of glory. Just one name over all Jesus reigns, I know. Nations bow, mountains shake at the sound of just one name. right come on i can do that i can do that all right well man what a great message guys and uh at the core of it is this issue of trust are we really trusting god are we really exercising faith for our identity for our purpose and gosh it, it comes out in so many ways doesn't it i have that conversation with god every day and uh every morning he says the same things i'm god give it back right like he and I constantly have to give it back to him because I so want to control my destiny and things in my life, uh, kind of compulsively sometimes. But uh, one of the encouragements that I have for you is that's why God gives us Christian friends. That's why spiritual companions for this journey, like we're seeing in the book of Acts, is so important to have friends in your life who are gonna call you on your BS or whatever you wanna call it, right? How you convince yourself that you're trusting God, but you're not you're really trusting in yourself. So Reagan, if somebody wanted to take that step in, in the weeks to come to connect with people in a more meaningful way, how could they do that here? We hope to have made that really simple and easy for you guys because we do want to be a community that is accountable to one another to live out the will of God here on earth. So if you're new here, you're just checking us out, you can say hi by texting new to the number on the screen. No obligation, just someone there to answer you if you have any questions. 
Now, if you're interested in getting more involved here, maybe you want to serve, you're interested in baptism, or you have a specific care need you want us to know about, your next step would be to text NEXT to that number, and someone will be in touch with the information you're looking for. And lastly, if you met Jesus this morning as your Lord and Savior, or maybe you have more questions about who he is and what he's all about, you're going to text Jesus to that number as well and start a conversation with someone who can answer your questions or be a resource for you. Awesome. Thanks, Reagan. Hey, guys, uh, God is doing so many cool things through this faith community, through our lives being intertwined, uh, through energy that we spend together and resources that we spend together. And I mean, it's in my my encouragement to you is if you consider Crossroads your home church, we would love for you to partner with us with your time and energy or with your financial resources. And you can give in one of three ways. You can go to the Crossroads website. You can download the Crossroads app. Or as you leave today, there's these black kiosks that you can uh, uh, put uh, checks and money and really anything in there. And there's also a QR code if you want to just scan it and you can download the Crossroads app like that. But one of the cool things about being a family together is that we we celebrate together. And today, I mean, it, it's like when you guys go outside, it, it's like Dave and Buster's or like if, if you're old school, it's like Chuck E. Cheese, right? It's crazy out there. We have so many fun things in store for you. We are celebrating the opening of our, our kids' play area uh, where uh, tons of volunteers have helped to make that happen. And a shout out to Rick Green, who oversaw, yeah, rocking guy, rocking guy. He made it happen and our volunteers are. So we're gonna celebrate that and we're going to uh, just enjoy the goodness of God together out there. So I'd encourage you, uh, plan, plan to spend some time, have a grilled cheese, a brat, a hot dog, and hang out and just get to know each, each other as we go out there together. Before we release you this morning to go have all that fun you're gonna have, um, my name is Reagan and I have had the pleasure of, been, of being a pastoral resident here for almost the past two years. And today is my last Sunday with you as a host. And so, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I just wanna say thank you for graciously inviting me into your community so that I could learn what Reagan has to contribute to the growth of the kingdom of God here on earth, what I'm gonna do next. And someone actually asked me after the first service, where are you headed next? And my answer to that is almost directly to labor and delivery first. <laughs> And I'm gonna be a mom for a little while and then we'll figure out where I belong, but uh, that's why I'm heading out at this time. So on my way in as I was driving, just in gratitude, <laughs> I was thanking God for you and our pastors here. And I asked God, as my final benediction to this church, what would you have me say? And I think that's Romans 15, five through six. I'm not texting, I just have it pulled up on my phone. So if you're ready, you can go ahead and push your hands out to receive this blessing. Crossroads Church, outside of your Holy Spirit given gifts. The most powerful thing you can contribute to this community is unity. So may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ that together you may with one singular powerful voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now you guys get out there and have some fun.